I want to especially uh, thank uh, to my Christian, uh, Sophia Lafferty Hess, and Mandy Gooch, uh, Donna Brooks, and several of our students, Maria, Rachel, and Rachel, who actually did all the work organizing our 90th uh, anniversary celebration. So a special thanks to all of you. If you like the food, if you like the program, if you like the things in the swag bag, those are the people uh, to thank. Um, we're here today to celebrate 90 years of service to the university, to the citizens of North Carolina, and to the world that's embodied in the accomplishments of the Howard Odom Institute. Uh, for those who might not know, uh, the Institute provides core research services and infrastructure to social scientists uh, on campus, broadly defined. We help with surveys, focus groups, statistical methods, spatial analysis, web scraping, data management, grant development, the broader impacts of your study, any aspect of social science research you can imagine uh, we try to support. Institute's named after Howard W. Odom. Uh, Howard Odom earned uh, uh, two PhDs um, for you graduate students who think you're busy. Um, PhDs in both psychology and sociology. Uh, Dr. Odom came to UNC in 1920, where he founded and directed the School of Public Welfare and the Department of Sociology. Uh, if that wasn't enough, he also helped establish the Department of Planning, uh, University of North Carolina Press, the journal Social Forces, and when he ran out of things to do, he founded the uh, Institute for Research and Social Science in 1924. He wrote more than 20 scholarly books. He wrote three novels. He was president of the American Sociological Association. And one interesting tidbit I learned uh, just recently, uh, Howard Odom was responsible for hiring the first faculty female member, uh, female faculty member here at UNC. Howard Odom launched this center in 1924 with a focus on studying uh, uh, problems and challenges in the South, particularly the role of race in the South. A courageous thing to do at a public university in 1924. Uh, he believed that serious scholarship and social science was needed to tackle the challenging issues of the day. We now seek to show the same courage and leadership uh, supporting scholarship and research in the social sciences. Every major challenge facing our world today requires the engagement of social sciences to solve them. Whether it's uh, fostering economic growth or dealing with econo economic inequality, obesity, immigration, climate change, national, national security, risk management, data, privacy, and security, all of these things are social science. I recently spent uh, an unanticipated car ride with a cardiologist. Uh, I was fine. Uh, who told me that he would trade all the research being done in genetics relative to cardiovascular disease if someone could tell him how to get people to stop smoking, take a 30-minute walk, and eat a salad every now and then. These are social science problems. Uh, we provide the solution. <coughs> Some of the same challenges exist for social science that uh, Howard Odom faced uh, but there are new challenges and opportunities. Data science and the big data revolution, for example, occupies a lot of our time. And in our view in the Odom Institute, big data is revolutionary because now it's data about people. Big data has been with us for a long time, but big data about people is what's new and what's novel and why it's front page news. Social scientists need to be in the thick of this. So what have we been up to lately in the Odom Institute? Well, in the last year or so, we moved into new space with our new neighbors in the library. We've launched a graduate fellows program uh, with the help of Neil Karen in the sociology department. Last year, we taught more than 90 courses, and workshops and short courses, more than 9,000 student hours of instructional uh, services provided through them, countless hours of one-on-one -on -one consulting, we operate the Qualtrics site license on campus. Uh, UNC folk have uh, uh, executed 1,000 Qualtrics surveys, generating 500,000 respondents in the last year. <coughs> Thank you, Teresa. Uh, there, yeah, that's right. 
Uh, we continue to operate one of the uh, international leading uh, social science data archives, uh, John and your crew, uh, with more than 10,000 users of our archives, downloading data, accessing data from our archives uh, in the last year. We've greatly expanded our grant generating efforts. We uh, tripled our external report uh, last year over the year before. We've formed new partnerships and deepened old partnerships with Davis Library, RENC, NCVS, NC Tracks, and many, many others. We're now working to develop what we call a prototype of what we call the Virtual Institute for Social Research. So we've been busy. We're very proud to carry on the mission that Howard Odom started 90 years ago. We think the next 90 years uh, hold just as much promise, uh, just as much excitement. I probably won't be here to share that with folks. Um, <laughs> but we take the challenge uh, very seriously. Now I'd like to turn, uh, turn over the podium here for a few moments to uh, Dr. Barbara Entwistle. Uh, Barbara is a distinguished professor of sociology here at UNC, uh, vice chancellor for research at UNC. Uh, for those who don't know, Barbara is a social demographer who studies population health and the environment. Barbara came uh, to UNC a little bit later than Howard Odom, 1985. <laughs> uh, and among her many uh, achievements, she was the director of the Carolina Population Center from 2002 to 2010. She's the president of the Sociological Research Association, past president of the Population Association of America, past editor of that organization's flagship journal, Demography, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Winner of the UNC Distinguished Teaching Award for both post baccalaureate instruction. She's the author of more than 80 uh, academic publications, as near as I can find out, and has a record of uh, funding for her research that exceeds many small colleges and universities. <laughs> uh, it's our great pleasure, my great pleasure, uh, to turn this over to Barbara Anderson. <laughs> I appreciate that introduction, um, and it's really a privilege and a pleasure to, to be here. As uh, Vice Chancellor for Research, my portfolio on campus spans um, the entire university, but I have to say that the Odom Institute and Social Science Research have a special place in my heart, and, uh, and so that makes it a particular pleasure to be here um, today. Tom mentioned um, the Odom Institute is the oldest university-based social science research institute in the United States. We should really feel proud about that. And it's the oldest institute of any kind here at Carolina, given how controversial sets and institutes are these days. I don't know if that's a distinction or not, but, uh, but it is a fact. Um, it is named for Howard Washington Odom. Um, in addition to founding the institute, he founded my home department. He founded the, um, the School of Public Welfare, which is now our social work school, and of course founded one of the top three journals in, um, in sociology, Social Forces, which is edited here at Carolina. So this o Odom Institute didn't always have this name. Um, when I came to Carolina almost three decades ago, it was called the Institute for Research and Social Sciences, or IRSS. Um, John Reed made this change uh, sometime in the 90s. I should know the date, but I don't. Um, excuse me? 99. 99, just, uh, just in the nick of time. Um, but I can say that it was an inspired decision. If you think of the name IRSS, there's something kind of hissy about it. <laughs> it. It just doesn't have the same warm feel that the Odom Institute has. And as the Odom Institute has uh, extended its reputation all over campus, uh, it's something that people can say with, with pride. And I note, actually, in your new space, it doesn't say the Odom Institute for Research and Social Sciences. It simply says the Odom Institute. I found that interesting. So I've known three directors of the Odom Institute fairly well, one of them extremely well. Um, <laughs> John Shelton Reed, of course, Ken Bolin, who is my husband, for those of you who don't know, and Tom Carsey. Um, collectively, they cover, I think, more than 25 years of the center's recent history, and I, I wanted to say just a little bit about that. Each of them placed their own mark um, on the Institute uh, over this time. So um, at the time that John Shelton Reed was appointed director, um, my memory is that the Institute had fallen on hard times. And he's, he's nodding yes. This is a piece that I don't see written down anywhere, but maybe somebody ought to. 
um, and he can tell you all the details. I just remember what an assistant professor might have known at that time. Um, but what I do remember is that the time that John was appointed to be director, there was really some serious question about whether the institute would continue at all. Okay, that's how bad the times were. So significantly, what John first did when he became director was put the institute on a firm footing. And we owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude for that. We wouldn't be here if he had not done that. Um, but of course, that's not all John did. Um, I wouldn't want to give you that impression. And I, I can only begin to, to say a few things here. Um, you know, he was running Carolina Pulse for the Atlanta Constitution. I mean, that's a long time ago, but it was pretty cool um, at the time. <laughs> He spun out a new center. You know, the Center for the Study of the American South was hatched at the Odom Institute and was one of uh, John's uh, creations. And as I said, you know, he, he came up with this current name, which I think was one of the great gifts. There's so much more I can say. I'm just going to hit a few highlights. Um, but um, I really am very grateful um, to John. So Ken built on that foundation. Um, what did he do? Uh, a lot of things. He greatly expanded the training that was offered by the Institute. Um, the, uh, he, personally, and the Odom Institute were the first to offer ICPS or shorter <coughs> courses off of the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. So we led that, um, and, and that happened then. Um, he and Paul Beamers, who, are, who is here, um, from RTI, founded the Survey Certificate Program, which continues to this day and is a major focus for the Institute. He also expanded the methodology supported by the Institute and appointed PhDs to statistical consulting positions, which is one of the most popular things, aside from all of those people coming through your training programs, that, that is true on, on the campus. Um, and he also extended the reach of the institute. He didn't see social science. Uh, he, well, he had a very broad view. He saw social science all over the place. So now, um, you know, I hear about the Odom Institute when I'm over in the School of Medicine, which I don't think I, I used to. Um, I would mention that terrible other evening when our Chancellor was speaking to a town hall about the events of last week, one of the things she mentioned quite spontaneously was the Odom Institute and the role that they had played in helping sort out issues involving our admission policies. And so I thought, fabulous, isn't that great? And Tom is continuing in this tradition. You know, he led the move of the Odom Institute to its new space, um, and, and the space is beautiful, and he's building new collaborations with Davis Library. It's a, a natural partnership, I think, and the co-location will just contribute. Um, together with Stan Ahalt at Renzi, he's developing this new virtual institute for social research, or visor. Uh, he didn't say much about it, maybe he's too modest, but what it will ultimately do is uh, it really leverages strengths at both places to enable collaborations across the campus and around the world. Uh, so it's very exciting. It's still in sort of prototype mode, um, but has tremendous uh, potential. And he's also building uh, exciting new collaborations with Sage Publications, which I don't think you mentioned, but, um, but is also uh, worth mentioning. So, you know, these are just a few things. Um, in each case, there's much more that could be said. Um, but I, I think each of these makes clear that uh, what the Odom Institute does is to blaze new trails while it honors its long-standing traditions of who it is and what its contribution has been. And as we celebrate 90 years, we look back appropriately, but we also look forward. And um, I look forward, particularly, to watching the Odom Institute <coughs> lead social science into the future, into the coming decades and century. Thank you very much. Um, Barbara has been a fantastic advocate and supporter of the Odom Institute. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. Finally, let me turn to our, our keynote uh, speaker this evening, Alan Murray. Uh, Alan is currently the editor of Fortune magazine, has held that illustrious post for how many months now? Two. Two. <laughs> Two months. So he's got it all figured out. If you got any questions, he knows exactly what, what's going on. Um, you all know Fortune magazine, um, uh, clearly one of the nation's leading financial publications. Alan previously served as president of the Pew Research Center. Uh, under his 18 months there, um, among uh, a number of interesting things that happened. Uh, I, think, I think Alan really helped modernize elements of, of that center. Uh, website traffic doubled to the center. Social media references to uh, Pew Research efforts tripled during his tenure there. But Alan spent most of his career working in various capacities at the Wall Street Journal, uh, where he served as the Washington bureau chief, um, 
During his time as uh, Washington bureau chief, uh, the Wall Street Journal won three Pulitzer Prizes. Um, he served as deputy managing editor of the Wall Street Journal and also executive editor of its website. Um, he took a break in the middle in there somewhere uh, to be Washington bureau chief at CNBC, where he co-hosted the Capitol Report from 2002 to 2005. Uh, when he wasn't busy doing all those things, he's written four books. He's received a master's degree in economics from the London School of Economics. But most important, Alan received a bachelor's degree right here at UNC. Um, Alan was a Moorhead scholar here and received a bachelor's degree in English literature. So you can go home and your know, kids can tell their parents you can do something with a bachelor's degree in English literature. Uh, if, if Alan is any model, Alan, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's a huge, huge honor uh, to be here on this occasion, the 90th anniversary of the Odom Institute. Fortune is only 84, so we, although I told Tom we're going to catch up. Uh, uh, and it's an honor to, to speak to, to uh, this distinguished group. It's really, I, uh, I know there are many, uh, uh, in, beyond the front row, a number of people in the audience who've had very distinguished careers in social sciences. I'm really uh, proud to be here and, and speaking to you today. And I want to just speak for a few minutes about what I see as two great challenges facing social science research and one huge opportunity facing social science research. Uh, now, as Tom pointed out, when I was invited to give this address several months ago, I actually ran a social science research institute. Uh, um, uh, but since then, I've had a relapse into journalism, <laughs> which, which is my first love. Uh, journalism occupies a place in human society that's similar to the uh, place that uh, catfish occupy in marine society. <laughs> but, but I say that as someone who loves catfish. Uh, and Tom, you were very kind not to withdraw my invitation uh, 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 to speak here. But We, here's we the, already printed the program, so. <laughs> <laughs> what could you do? That's right. I apologize for that. But here's the thing that unifies my, my previous career and my current career and it unifies what I do and, and, and what you do. Uh, we're all in the business of seeking truth. Uh, we are all in the business of, of looking for facts. Uh, and facts are the very lifeblood of democracy. Uh, a, a couple of quotes. Abraham Lincoln said, I'm a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them real facts. Uh, J.N. Pugh, who was one of the founders of the Pew Charitable Trust, which funds the Pew Research Center, was much more uh, sparse with his words. Uh, in the, during the Great Recession, Time Magazine was going out to business leaders and trying to get advice on what the government should do to turn the situation around, and they kept bothering J.N. Pugh, and he kept refusing to uh, answer. And finally, he agreed, and he wired back six words, tell the truth, Trust the people. Uh, and then my own favorite was from Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a, a breed of senator that doesn't seem to exist anymore. Uh, but in the midst of one heated debate, he said, look, look, everyone is entitled to his own opinions, but everyone is not entitled to his own facts. Um, so that, that's, that's what I believe in. That's what you believe in. Unfortunately, Moynihan's warning seems to have been forgotten today uh, in American political debate at any rate. We live at an unfortunate moment in history when real facts, commonly agreed on trusted facts, seem to have become increasingly scarce. Uh, it's common these days to hear intense political debates in which completely contradictory facts are thrown out and wielded as, as weapons. And the body of shared, generally accepted truth seems to be shrinking rapidly. Uh, in the journalism world, there is no Walter Cronkite to say, that's the way it was. Uh, uh, there is wild disagreement. Uh, in the first few weeks after I took over at, at Pew in Washington, I ran into Jim Gilmore, who was the former governor of Virginia uh, and a former head of the uh, uh, Republican National Committee. And he said, oh, you're back in Washington. What are you doing? And I explained I was president of the Pew Research Center. And he looks at me and he says, oh, so you're a liberal now. 
Uh, so it was in the middle of a party, and I didn't want to get in a fight, and so I just let the, let the comment pass. But the next day, I went, sat down at my computer, and I said, Governor, I just want to explain to you that the Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan institute. Uh, that we don't take policy positions. We are not involved in advocacy. Uh, uh, we are simply using our, our research tools to uh, present facts devoid at least as much as humanly possible of partisanship. And he wrote back a one sentence note, which I remember very clearly. It said, I believe all research is done in the service of someone's advocacy. And think about that. I believe all research is done in the service of someone's advocacy. That was a, a direct affront to what I had devoted my life to. I think it's a direct affront to what many of you have devoted your lives to, and probably an affront to what Howard Washington Odom intended this institute uh, uh, to be. And yet, it's not an uncommon view in today's, uh, in today's political debates. Now, I don't want to sound, sound naive here. I know that research, like journalism, is done by human beings, and human beings are the product of their own history, and human beings are inherently uh, influenced by their biases. But the notion that we can't or we shouldn't at least strive to overcome those biases, uh, the notions that we can't or we shouldn't try to search for truth, uh, uh, the notion that we can't or shouldn't try and find some kind of common ground on which we can have public debates about important issues is a deeply, deeply disturbing one to me. Uh, and yet it has become an increasingly common notion as our, uh, politi uh, our political conversation has become increasingly polarized. Now, as Tom told you a minute ago, I was not a, a social science uh, major. I, I did take John Reed's sociology course, uh, but, uh, but uh, I was an English major. Uh, but one of my favorite writers was William Butler Yeats. Uh, uh, who a century ago wrote a poem that in some ways captures the political situation uh, that we're in today. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon can adhere the falconer. Things fall apart, <coughs> the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. <laughs> the best last, lack all conviction while the worst are full of passion and intensity. Let me give you some facts. In January of, of this year, we were able at the Pew Research Center, I, I was uh, uh, raised some money from the um, uh, uh, Hewlett Foundation in California and also the MacArthur Foundation to enable us to do the biggest political survey we had ever done uh, up to that point. It was uh, uh, 10,000 uh, 10,000 participants. If you haven't looked at it on our website, I would urge you to look at it. It's a, it's a wealth of insights. But one of the things we did in that survey is we asked people a series of 10 questions about their political values that we have been asking for over 20 years. So we had a, a, a good timeline of that. But many of them were forced, for, forced choice, the 10 were forced choice questions. I'll give you a few examples just so you can uh, get a sense of it. And these, by the way, by their nature, you social scientists will know these forced choice questions are a little bit annoying because you want to say, well, it's not quite that, but it's not quite that either, and you're not given that option. You have to choose one or the other. For instance, uh, which of these statements comes closer to, to uh, your views? And I'm going to ask for a show of hands on this. <laughs> government is almost always wasteful and efficient, inefficient, or government often does a better job than people give it credit for. Show of hands, which of you think that closer to your belief, the statement uh, is uh, government is almost always wasteful and efficient? Put me on the spot. Yes, <laughs> I am putting you on the spot. Well, we've got a few in here. But they're not opposed. <laughs> well, I know, that's the irritating thing about it. Government often does a better job than people give it credit for, show of hands. Okay. Uh, uh, they're both true. Uh, I know you have to choose one or the other. Uh, poor, poor, we, can, we can talk about methodology. We can talk about methodology afterwards. Poor people today have it easy because they can get government benefits without doing anything in return. Or poor people have hard lives because government benefits don't go far enough to help them live decently. 
Show of hands, which of you feel poor people today have it easy because they can get government benefits without doing anything in return? Got one hand there. <laughs> no, there are a couple of hands like sort of coming up in the back. Poor people have hard lives because government, because government benefits don't go far enough to help them live decently. Show of hands. And now they're free to give a one stand. Yeah, I know, I know. We'll talk about that. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, here, uh, here's another one. This one, of course, has shown dramatic change in the last decade or two. Homosexuality should be discouraged by society. Homosexuality should be accepted by society. Show of hands, discouraged by society. Not going to get a single hand on that. <laughs> accepted by society. So those were the kinds of questions. And, and the beauty is you can argue, you can argue over the wording of the questions. Uh, but the beauty is we had 20 years of history on these questions. And what we found was that Americans still have a pretty uh, uh, a complicated mix of liberal and conservative views, but the distribution is no longer normal. The tails have become fat. Uh, the, 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 the number of people who hold consistently conservative views or consistently liberal views has doubled over the last two decades, from uh, about 10% of the total to 21% of the total. And even more disturbing than that, what the research found was that part of partisan animosity has increased substantially. So the percentage of people in uh, either party who told us that they have a highly negative view of the other party uh, had also more than doubled in the last 20 years. So, so something profound has happened in our society in the last two decades in the way uh, we think along uh, ide ideological lines. Uh, um, uh, and by the way, the, the research showed uh, that the polarization was was not the result of just movement on, on one side or the other. Some people talk about asymmetrical polarization. It's just the Republicans who have gone off the edge. In fact, you, you saw movements on, on both wings, on both sides. There were some other really interesting elements to this, and that's why I would urge you to spend some time with it and look at it. Uh, uh, we asked people about how they choose to live. Uh, we said, you know, do you, would you prefer to live in a neighborhood where the houses are closer together and you can walk to schools, restaurants, and stores? Uh, or would you prefer to live in a neighborhood where the houses are further apart and you have large yards, but you have to drive to get anywhere? Um, amazing political division on that. Uh, uh, consistent conservatives, uh, it was 70, over 70 percent. 75 percent of the consistent conservatives said they'd rather live in neighborhoods where the houses are far apart than they drive to amenities. 75 percent of the consistent liberals wanted to live in neighborhoods uh, uh, where the houses are closer together. And, and, and that, of course, is a, a, an indication of part of what's happened over the last few decades, a sorting out of society where people are more and more living with people who have, or living near people who have views uh, uh, similar to theirs. I can tell you that this room is not uh, <laughs> uh, perfectly representative of the U.S. <laughs> population based on the, on the, on the last, last uh, those three questions we asked earlier. Um, then what was, what was interesting uh, also was that we, we, in this 10,000 10, sample poll, we recruited 3,000 people to participate in uh, online follow-up surveys. And one of the first things we did was go back to them and ask them about their media habits. Where do they get their information? What news sources uh, do they watch? And of course, in asking those questions, we already knew pretty much everything about their political beliefs. So we knew where on the political spectrum they fell. Uh, and, and what we found was that uh, among conservatives, 47% said Fox News was their main source of news. How many people in this room would say Fox News is their main source of news? Show of hands. Yeah, I, I had a feeling that was not the uh, uh, um, 88% of consistent conservatives said they trusted Fox. On the other side, liberals said they had no trust in Fox, cited NPR and the New York Times. <laughs> as their trusted sources of information. Now, I'm a news omnivore. I watch all those sources of news. And I can tell you that if you only watch one or the other, you have a very, very different view of what's going on in the world right now. Uh, you might as well be uh, on other, other planets. Social networks have only compounded these trends because uh, people have a tendency to follow uh, others who have like views. 47% of consistent conservatives told us that the posts about politics they see on Facebook are mostly or always in line with their own views. Uh, and we had about 32% of consistent uh, 
liberals who said the same thing. Uh, technology also reinforces that. Uh, the, the modern websites and social networks have uh, al personalization algorithms that are designed to give you things they think you'll like. And if you have a demonstrated preference for liberal views, they're going to give you more of that, not less. So a dramatic change in the way uh, uh, people are, are consuming information. Now, it, it's important to note that when I'm talking about consistent conservatives and consistent liberals, I'm still talking about a minority of the population as a whole. We're only talking about 21% of the total. But the other thing we found was those are the people who vote in primaries. Those are the people who make contributions to members of Congress. Those are the people that go to town hall meetings. They have an undue influence on the, on the political system. So there's good reason uh, uh, to be concerned about what's happening on the wings. So I see that as the first challenge that you face as social scientists, to reassert the existence and the importance and the primacy of facts. Now, we need to reinforce institutions like the Odom Institute that can provide trusted information that can be used by both sides of the debate. Because it's very hard to have a debate if there isn't some common ground on which to have it. Uh, we need to make it clear that while public debate is a healthy thing, it needs to be rooted in facts. That's challenge number one. Uh, let me move on to the second challenge, which I think many of you are, are uh, particularly the methodologists in the room, are fully aware of. Uh, I, I talked about this survey we did. It was a, a telephone <coughs> survey, random digit dial. Um, uh, we call telephone numbers until we get someone to agree to answer the survey. The problem is fewer and fewer people today are willing to do that. I'm told someone, uh, uh, John, you can correct me on this, I'm told that when I graduated from college, response rates below 70% were considered a problem. Uh, well, uh, 15 years ago at the Pew Research Center, we were down to about 35%. So you go from 70 to 35%. Last year, we were at 10%. 10%. 10% response rates in, in, in our telephone surveys. Now, we have very good methodologists. In fact, my chief, the, at Pew, the chief methodologist was a man by the name of Scott Keeter, who uh, uh, came from here at the University of North Carolina. And they would tell me that uh, uh, they can make adjustments and they can assure that you get solid results, even though you have a response rate of only 10%. But I have to say, I left somewhat skeptical. Uh, I'm not surprised by the 10%, by the way. I mean, I, I don't know about any of you, but I find that I hardly ever talk on, except to my mother. My mother is the one uh, 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 person I talk to on the telephone. Otherwise, and if I try to call my daughters on the telephone, I will get uh, uh, angry retorts saying, why are you calling me? Why don't you text, text me, please? Uh, so people just don't have 20 minute telephone conversations uh, these days. But I can't help but think that there are some inherent biases uh, that separate the 10% of the population that's willing to spend 20 minutes on the phone to do a Pew Research Center poll and the 90% of the population that isn't willing to do that. Um, and in fact, we had an interesting example of that during the uh, uh, 2012 election. It happened right before uh, I got there. If you'll remember in the first debate uh, between President Obama and Mitt Romney, the president did a pretty poor job. I think that was a universal perception that he really blew it. Uh, and we put out a poll that was done shortly after that that showed a, uh, an 8 percent increase in support for Mitt Romney as a result of that. At the same time, there were other panel pollsters who were going back to the same people to see if anybody had changed their opinion based on the debate. And they found no one had changed their opinion. Now, how could it be that our poll was showing an 8% increase in support for Mitt Romney if the panel polls were showing no one had changed their opinion? Well, the answer to that is that one possible answer, we don't know for sure what happened, but one possible answer is the people who supported Obama were kind of bummed out and didn't want to talk to the pollsters. Uh, and if you, you know, if you, when you're only talking to 10% of the population to begin with, to project the full population, a small change in people's willingness to talk to the pollsters can turn into a pretty big movement in the polls. Now, now the initial response of my uh, methodologist was, well, that's not really the way most people most people aren't going to decide whether or not they're going to talk to a pollster based on 
whether they thought their guy did a good job. Well, that may be true, but most people aren't talking to the pollsters anyway. So you're really only talking about affecting the 10% who are willing to spend 20 minutes on the phone having a conversation about, about politics. So I, so I think there is, I think there's a, a real problem there. Now, we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years experimenting with solutions. Are there other ways to get better response rates? We did an experiment with uh, uh, Google Trends uh, uh, and, and Google polling. They can, uh, uh, the problem with, with, they can reach large numbers of people. Uh, the problem is they'll only let you ask two or three questions. If you can only ask two or three questions, you can't get the demographics down. They said, don't worry about that. We impute the demographics. So we checked their imputed demographics and we had a uh, a 25-year-old woman in the office who looked up how her demographics had been imputed by Google, and she was came, came down as a 55-year-old man. So, uh, <laughs> so there's a problem there, uh, clearly. Um, we, when I left two months ago, we were in the midst of an experiment with SurveyMonkey, uh, which does online surveys with uh, large numbers of people to see if there was something we could do there. Of course, you have the rise, many of you are probably familiar with the rise of, of YouGov, an online poll, but if you look closely into YouGov's methodology, you'll learn that they, that they weight their polls based on Census Bureau survey data and Pew Research Center survey da data. So you, you, you've got to have something, you've got to have an anchor there uh, to weigh that. So we don't know the answer uh, to the survey problem. Uh, and it is a serious problem, and I suspect most of you in this uh, room would agree to me, and that's the second big problem facing social science research, and I would think, think facing the Odom Institute. That leads to the opportunity, which Tom has uh, already referred to. At the same time these things are going on, you have this explosion in data, organic data, data exhaust, data that's just kicked off by the way we live and the things we do and how they're and, and how they are measured and and I think that means we are at the dawn of something new and exciting that we don't quite understand yet and we don't quite know how to get our arms around yet but the, that that will at some point in the not too distant future revolutionize social science uh, and in many ways make it better I mean one of the things we did at uh, we routinely at the Pew Research Center would ask people about their newspaper reading habits and we also had a large religion project, so we would ask people how often they uh, uh, went to church. Well, we know people do not answer those questions accurately. <laughs> they way over-report how often they read newspapers, and they way over-report how often they, uh, they go to church. And even on some fairly benign things, uh, 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 someone showed me data uh, once showing that if you ask people, have you bought a refrigerator in the last year, you will get a response that adds up to double the sales of refrigerators in the last year. Um, so, so there's a problem in asking people to tell you their behavior. Well, increasingly, uh, uh, we can actually see their behavior. You don't have to ask. The data's there. We're measuring it. We're watching. Our, our daily lives are, are, are being digitized more and more, and, and figuring out how to get our arms around that. In some cases, it's going to be a question of figuring out how we disgorge the data from private industry. Uh, but I'll give you a, uh, one of my favorite examples. There's a, there's a young man by the name of Seth Stevens Davidowitz who has a PhD in economics from Harvard and went to work at Google. And occasionally, he does research with the Google data firehose that he publishes in the New York Times, and it's fascinating stuff. For instance, he had one last year where he looked at searches that parents do about their sons and their daughters. And he found that uh, uh, the question, is my son gift, questions like, is my son gifted, is my son smart, are asked twice as often as, is my daughter gifted, is my daughter smart, twice as often. And on the other side, questions like, is my daughter overweight? Uh, is, is my daughter ugly are asked twice as often as is my son overweight or is my son ugly. That something tells you something very profound about attitudes that you would never pick up, I don't believe. I don't believe you could ever pick up in a public opinion survey. Uh, he's done other things. Some of it is just fun. He used Facebook data to show that, uh, that age eight 
is the critical age for forming baseball team loyalties. Uh, and so if, if a team won the World Series, if you were eight when a team won the World Series, you were much more likely to be a lifelong fan of that team. Um, uh, he also did another uh, piece using Google data estimating the uh, gay population of the United States uh, based on pornographic searches. So, uh, I, I mean, some of these, these are, these are just uh, uh, examples of the kind of possibilities that are opened up by data. I'll tell you another favorite one. Uh, apparently, if you, if you read an iBook or Kindle, they track uh, uh, where you put bookmarks in the book. Right, so they were able to take a bunch of books and say, okay, how far into this book did people really get? <laughs> Thomas Piketty's Capital, I think it was page three. <laughs> and then they were gone. <laughs> I left the other 800 pages. That, uh, 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 so uh, those are just uh, small, maybe trivial examples, but there are gonna be more and more of these things. And again, much of the data is held in the hands of private industry. I, uh, there's a, a fellow by the name of Alex Lasky who runs a company called Opower that recently went uh, public. And what Opower does is work with public utilities to try and influence people's energy saving behavior. And so he has access to all this data that comes from the utilities about how people uh, are, con are consuming energy. And they've done all kinds of interesting experiments. For instance, uh, they found out that you, you have dramatically better results in getting people to conserve. It, you have, well, let me do it the other way around. Dramatically less favorable results if they send you a note saying, if you do this, you will save $100 a month. And much better uh, results if they say, your next door neighbor is doing this and saving $100 a month. <laughs> that, that, and they proved this. I mean, they've, they've, they've done it with their research. I mean, I spent a lot of time over the last two years talking to a lot of people in this field trying to understand who really gets it, who is really on top of what the data revolution means for social science. And my conclusion was no one does. I don't know if any of you would disagree with that. I think we are at the infancy of this. Uh, and it's going to require the kind of cross-disciplinary approach that the Odom Institute has built its reputation on. And I think it is virgin territory, an opportunity uh, for this place uh, to really make a, a mark for itself. So uh, I wish you luck, Tom, Thank you. on all three challenges. Uh, the nation needs you, and I hope you invite me back in a decade, and we can see how you're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. One other thing that hurts me is, how do you think people are good, um, is the public, how well is the public going to adapt or accept this? Um, I'm just thinking about the, the, the issue with Facebook recently when yep. they found out, oh, we're being experimented, as if, as if marketers aren't constantly experimenting on people. Is that something that's going to be a problem? Privacy. I, I think privacy is, a, is a, a big, big issue. And look, in, in some areas, the potential social benefit of the data is going to be enormous. Think about health. I mean, I'm told, I don't know if any of you are involved in health research, I'm told that the development time for a, uh, a, a therapy, a, a, a biotech therapy, uh, these days is commonly 20 years, because that's how long it takes to, you know, from the bench to the time you do all the live experiments, et cetera, to get FDA approval is 20 years. I've been told by people who know what they're talking about that if you had access to anonymized data of a large portion of the population with DNA uh, data in there that you might be able to shrink that to as little as two years or three years. So think of the benefit of taking that 20 year development time for two or three years. But what it requires is for us to say, sure, you can have my data and use it uh, for research purposes. And people are very uncomfortable with that. Uh, the, the, the CEO of Kaiser uh, told me that they would, they, they had, Kaiser is big enough that they have an awful lot of data just inside their system, but they have to get permission to do it. Um, and he said it's, you get dramatically different results. In fact, if you ask people when they sign up for insurance, can we have access to your healthcare records anonymized for research, 50% will say no. But he said if you ask when they are ill, and it doesn't matter what the illness is, and it doesn't matter whether the research is relevant to their illness, if you ask when they're ill, that goes to 90% 90, 90 say yes. So. You know, I think there's going to have to be some understanding, first of all, some degree of confidence that when someone says the data is anonymized, that you know it really is anonymized. 
uh, but, but also some acceptance on the part of the public that we may have to sacrifice some of what we think are our privacy rights uh, in order to achieve huge social welfare gains. A couple other questions before, yes. One of the unmistakable trends in the media industry is the proliferation of sponsored content. Um, and this might seem like, a, and you know, proponents mostly media companies are saying that this is a, a natural response to the, to the fracturing of the media industry. Um, whereas critics are saying that this is inherently deceptive um, for the readers. And right. a bit of a forced response question for you. Which of those two <laughs> I don't agree with either of them. <laughs> uh, 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 look, um, uh, I talked about the importance of facts. Uh, I think the, a corollary to that is we as journalists can't be in the business of trying to deceive our readers. So I take a very simple approach to this, uh, and I've f fought my share of battles against advertising departments on this. I don't have an inherent objection to, um, uh, to uh, advertisers, in effect, saying instead of running a pretty picture, we're gonna, we want to write a piece, a think piece, that provides you some useful information. That's fine with me. Uh, I, the, the main, as long as it is clearly labeled, as long as the reader knows exactly what is going on. If it's an attempt to deceive the reader into thinking that they're reading a, a, a straight piece of journalism, I'm not going to sign off on it. Uh, uh, but if it's, but, and, and so if you look in Fortune magazine, when you see, you'll see native advertising, sponsor content, whatever you want to call it, top of the page, very clearly, bold black letters. I made them increase the boldness. It says either advertisement or sponsored content. So that, that's my view. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with, uh, 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 well, let me give you an example. I was at the journalism school earlier today with a woman who uh, uh, publishes a magazine called Worth, which is for high income people about how to manage their assets. They have wealth advisors come in and write pieces for them about strategies for managing their money. Well, as long as everybody knows that it's, it's written by a wealth advisor who wants to manage your money, I, I don't have a problem with that. I think it can actually be very useful. I do have a problem with the fact that most of the, the native content out there right now is just bad. It's just not very readable. You know, as a magazine editor, it's a problem for me to interrupt the flow of the magazine with four pages of dribble uh, because you, you, you increase the likelihood that they're not going to get beyond the uh, fourth page. But if it's compelling and it's clear to them what it is and they want to read it, I mean, it's a little bit, to me, it's a little bit like reading a, a Vanity Fair. If, if you read Vanity Fair, I mean, I find the advertisements are more interesting than the content most of the time. I love the advertisements. Wow. But you know they're advertisements, so. Yes? Uh, how do you decide what to trust in the advertisement if you can't check all the facts? You, you. I mean, how do you feel about that in your magazine? Uh, I, I, well, we won't ever publish anything, even as an advertisement, if we know it to be false. So we, we would never be involved in misleading our readers. I mean, you just have to understand that, uh, you know, when a uh, financial firm is offering you financial advice, they may have an interest in it, uh, 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 buyer beware. But my view is the important thing is you need to know it's coming from the financial firm. Yes? Um, you haven't said anything about neuroscience research. And there's this whole explosion yeah. now of research that suggests that the way we think and what we think and the way we feel and so on is influenced by biological phenomenon and so on. Um, do you think that's an area that the Odom Institute should be opening up to? It's an area I know nothing about. Uh, it was something we discussed. Uh, um, you know, some of the it, it, at uh, the Pew Research Center, we've got six different lines of research. There's the journalism line, the religion line, the political line. Uh, Hispanics, uh, social and demographic trends, and I'm forget. Oh, internet uh, technology. Uh, uh, interestingly, the journalism line was the uh, most um, experimental with methodology, and they proposed at one point using brain scans to try and sort of understand how people uh, consume news and react differently from news. I'm, I, I think it's an interesting possibility. I just don't know enough about the science. There may be somebody in here who knows more than I do. 
uh, to know how promising that is. Uh, you, you in the back there, yes. Yeah, uh, as you said, a lot of the a lot of the data about our everyday life today is with with private companies, my cell phone company, Google, Facebook, whatever. Can you? What do you think is a way of making some of the data available for research? Yeah. So so I spent some time on this. Uh, 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 one of. Uh, my board members at the Pew Research Center was Bob Groves, the former director of the census, who's now the provost at Georgetown University. And this is a problem he was very focused on, and he came to us and said, could Pew Research Center do this? I said, no, I'm not sure we want to be in the data warehousing business. But then I went to uh, the Pew Charitable Trust and said, you know, this is something that you should look into. If you think of J.M. Pew's six words, tell the truth, trust the people, somebody is going to have to step up and say, we will be the trusted Repository may not be the right word because I don't think what we're t talking about is physically placing the data in big servers on the site, but somebody who can set the protocols and the rules of the road and the privacy protections in place so that, so that this data can be uh, more broadly used. And, and, and they were looking at it. I, I think it will happen. Somebody will play that role. I don't think the government can play that role. The government is not in a trusted situation right now, particularly with the uh, NSA spying scandals and so forth. Um, uh, but I think there needs to be some sort of an intermediary to help, uh, and, and maybe the Odom Institute could play a role there, help, help establish the rules of the road so that companies can feel comfortable allowing their data to be used for research without worrying that it's going to be misused or invade people's privacy or uh, 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 compromise their intellectual property, et cetera. You had a question right here. Yes. Yeah, it's a really it's a it's a really interesting question. It is dramatically changing. Breaking news. Uh, uh, there's still some organizations. My, uh, my old employer, the Wall Street Journal, uh, uh, the New York Times, the AP. There's still organizations that are uh, breaking news, but 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 it's very hard to build a business model on it because it so quickly becomes commoditized. And it, and and as you said, it, you may hear it first on Twitter before you read it. Uh, uh, by one of those people. So it is changing the nature of, of the media business. I think one thing it is doing is pushing people towards more analysis, and as you move towards more analysis, inevitably some people move towards more opinion journalism. So it is doing that. I think it's also uh, causing news organizations to think about communities of influence, uh, you know, building uh, information sources for people who care about food, or people who care about sports, or people who care about uh, global politics or one particular part of the world. So you're seeing kind of a fracturing of the uh, media environment as a result. And, and the truth is we don't begin to know how all this is going to settle out. It is still a very uh, uneasy and unsettling time in media. If I were a rational human being, I never would have left the safety and comfort of the Pew Research Center to, <laughs> uh, to the uh, wildness and craziness of the media company, but I guess I'm not a rational human being. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Just a couple of quick comments before uh, everybody be sure to grab a, a gift bag on your way out the door. Um, that question about breaking news was, was very timely. Uh, someone was talking to us in the lobby that uh, they found out uh, recently that their daughter got engaged on Facebook <laughs> rather than through their daughter, say, calling them or something like that. And uh, 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 the question before, Ashok's question, was a bit of a, uh, a timely question. Uh, Ashok works at Renzi and, and with Odom and several other groups on campus are actually trying to push uh, an initiative uh, uh, that we're calling Data for the Public Good. Um, to try to tackle uh, some of these very important problems that you're talking about, and potentially uh, with the National Consortium for Data Science that Renzi launched, uh, also potentially provide that sort of trusted mediator uh, role, uh, link between industry, government, and, and universities. So, so it's, it's nice to know, Ashok, uh, Alan says we're on the right path. Um, thank you, Alan, again, very much. Thank all of you for coming. I don't know if there's any food left, but if there is, 
Please take, take it. <laughs> there are 47 bags back there. Please take one of those, or we got to all carry them back again. And there's a special surprise inside there. There's lots of cool stuff, but there's one special surprise in there that you're really going to like. So you really want to make sure you Thank you all very much.